I like that. <laughs> um, I think that's a testament. Whether you're, you know, a hundred thousand miles from home, or you know, you're you're ten minutes away, uh, you know, the Lord calls us to to love our neighbor as ourselves, and and. It's interesting because, you know, you hear that verse over and over and over again and and you hear it said all the time. Well, who's my neighbor? Everybody, any person you come in contact with is your neighbor. But it's also interesting when you look at that first part of that verse, it says it says love your neighbor. But it says what as who as yourself. We have to learn and develop a, a godly love for ourselves And that's not a prideful, selfish thing. I think many times some of us, we don't really love ourselves. (laughs) Simply put, I'll I'll say this. As believers, as followers of Jesus, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to cultivate in us a daily routine of spending time with the Lord. The whole reason why he sent his son to, to, to be the final sacrifice on the cross for us to resurrect from the dead is so that we could have unhindered fellowship with him just like the first Adam had before the fall. And, and when we don't carve out time for Christ above everything else in our lives, again, we, we just talked about it. Jesus is the answer to every problem we have. We don't need more money. Even if... If we're looking at your situation, you don't need more money. Even looking at a dire situation with your body, you don't need better health. You don't need all these exterior things. What you and I need is to grab hold of the God of all creation. The word of God says, seek he the kingdom of heaven first and everything else will be added on to you. Amen. When we don't carve out time for Christ, that's what I mean by loving yourself. We're not really loving ourselves when we don't put him as number one priority because he is our lifeline. He is the one that's going to reprogram everything and make it to where you're going to live above your circumstances. If you give him the the, the peanuts of your time, you're not going to be strong in the spirit and you're not going to be able to withstand the battles of the circumstances that you come across on a daily basis. But when you put him first, and you give them the first fruits of your being, your talent, your time, your resources. They went to the Philippines. You may not be called to go to the Philippines. Who could you bless? You got family members. I have family members. Who can we bless in our sphere of influence? And we know love is about doing the right thing, even when you're tired, even when you don't want to do it. That's biblical love. So again, Love yourself. I need to love myself like Christ loves the church, even if you're not married, and love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen? Those who have an ear, let them hear what the Spirit has to say. And I I love when when, when I hear that out of of the Word of God, because it it, it means hear with the intent to obey. (laughs) That has to be the goal. Not just hear to hear. Because I hear all the time. (laughs) Doesn't necessarily mean I'm listening. (laughs) Happens a lot with me and my wife. (laughs) She's like, are you listening to what I'm telling you? You may be hearing me. It shouldn't be like the peanut teacher. I need need to hone in. You know, and and I I was talking to uh, Mark this morning. Mark's like, how you doing? I said, I'm blessed. I'm doing good. I said, I was praying here before anybody came. And, you know, I'm just on my knees just being still before the Lord. And and I heard his voice and and the Lord's like, support your children, love them, encourage them. Don't get, don't get all frazzled. I I get like that a lot of times where, you know, my wife's trying to go over the, the, the worship songs and my daughter just started screaming, praising God. And, and I had to hold my tongue and be like, why why am I, why was I going to tell her? No, let her praise God. But again, we, we, we have to hear from the Lord and, and, and we have to be willing to obey. That's the thing. Not just hear, but hear and apply. Obey what you hear. Today, this morning, if if you hear the Lord's voice, do not harden your heart. Allow your heart to be soft and pliable and moldable 
and shapeable because your heavenly father has the best plans for your life. But it takes a a humble heart to say, not my will. We all have a will, right? We all have a strong will and we all have an idea of what we want to do with our lives. And it's good to have aspirations and dreams, but we got to lay those things before the God of all creation and allow him to have his will be done. Amen. This morning we're in Ecclesiastes. We're going to we did we did an overview of the book that this is the new book we're going into. Uh, We're going to be looking at verses one through eleven this morning. And this message is entitled All is Vanity. So I'm going to go ahead and, and read the text. And if you're able body, could you please stand for the reading of God's word? I'll read our Texas message. I'll pray. And then we'll get into the meat of the message. And I pray that, that you and, and, and I will be blessed by the word of God. So uh, once again, we're in the book of Ecclesiastes. We're starting in verse 1. And it says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is Vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind. And on its circuits, the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has already been in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. Let's go ahead and pray. Abba God, we thank you for just this timely reminder of, of what life looks like apart from you. It's weary. It's burdensome. It's tiresome. There's no meaning. There's no purpose. Men and women running to and fro from the ends of the earth trying to find some kind of solace, some kind of peace, some kind of refuge. But it's not in things. It's not in status. It's not in success. It's not in what we think is the good old American dream. It's centered around your son, Jesus. Father, would you reveal to us where Christ is at the heart of this content And may we be those who are wise enough through your anointing to focus our lives around Christ and not the other way around. We don't tell the Bible our dictate. The Bible dictates to us how we are to live. May we be wise enough to take heed to these instructions so that we may prosper in all that we do. May we not be those who can constantly kick against the goads, fighting against you, thinking that we're going to get far. Lord, we need a humble heart. We need your hand to be merciful upon us. Lord, would you lift us up? Would you exalt us so that we can be used for your good, so that we could glorify you in all we do? We pray that you would speak to us now through your word. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. So like I said, last week we, we touched on uh, the book. We, we did an overview of the book of Ecclesiastes. We kind of looked at what, were the, what are the main themes of this book. And, and, and this is the big kicker, right? How is it applicable to my life? How, how does this apply to me today? Because the, the, the last thing that I want 
for you, saints, and for myself is to hear this stuff, is to hear this information and it just roll off your back. It just roll off my back. There's a purpose and a meaning for it. And I think we gravitate to it more when we are able to see how does this apply to me? You see, the word of God will not return void. It's going to accomplish his purpose in every single person's life. And we just need to be aware. So we looked at, again, we looked at the timeline of when this book was written last week. Um, We looked at who the author of the book is. And we saw that much of the book of Ecclesiastes is written from the perspective of how life looks from someone who's, who's not looking to fulfill themselves in God. Not that, not that Solomon was godless. We know that he was not that at all. But this is the perspective of how this book was written. It was written from the perspective of someone who's pursuing everything but God. Everything but God. And what is the conclusion that they come to? You see, ultimately, the main theme of this book is that life and all of its activities are meaningless without a proper relationship with God and a holy fear of who he is. It's all meaningless. If you don't have the proper biblical worldview to see that you didn't create yourself, you didn't come from spawn, you didn't come from a monkey, you didn't evolve, you were fearfully and wonderfully created in your mother's womb and that God foreknew you before time even began. You have an intelligent designer. <laughs> so if, if we have a view of life through that lens, things are going to make sense to us. But when we think we just evolved And I'm just here and I don't have a soul and it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter what the choices I make. It doesn't matter how I I, I affect other people because it's just it's just random. Then life has absolutely no meaning at all. And that's part of the reason why you see all the chaos in the world. Obviously, we know it's because we live in a fallen world because of sin. But it also is because it's the compound of that. And you have so many individuals that are living godless lives. They're living sensual lives. They're living only for the flesh. And as we know, the flesh, all it wants to do is feed itself. It wants to gorge itself on whatever it wants. Whether that's more food, more sex, more drugs, more prestige, more fame, more fortune. That's the flesh. If you sow to the flesh, you will reap death, spiritual death. And we already know physical death. But if you sow to the spirit, you will reap life, abundant life, a life beyond this temporal phase that we're all in. You see, looking at the first portion of chapter one. This will set the stage for the entirety of this book. We have several main points this morning, and the first one is this. I think someone probably already guessed it. <laughs> without Jesus Christ, without, without um, the Messiah at the center of your life and my life, all activities are done in vain. This is the definition of vanity. Vanity. It is this inflated pride in oneself or in one's appearance. Conceit to be conceited is to be vain. Something that is vain, empty and valueless. That is what vanity is to be puffed up with this idea of of yourself and how you appear to be. And and, and so much of of Western culture on the surface, the cosmetic aspect of, 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 of this culture is all based on how do other people view me? That's what all social media is all about. Everybody that's on Twitter, they're concerned about what other people think about what they posted. Everything that every person puts on Facebook, they're concerned about what other people think they put. 
people that have their own YouTube page. And I'm not smashing on influencers and all that. You're an influencer. It is what it is. But they're so concerned on what other people think. What about what your God thinks? Do, do all these followers you have, does it re, is it really making a difference in your life personally? Is it making you a better person with better character and better morals and better integrity? Or is it only putting dollar bills in your pockets? Stuff that's going to be moth ridden and things that robbers can come in and break in and steal. This is what I'm talking about about understanding what is of value. This is what Solomon, inspired by the Holy Spirit, was talking about when he said everything is vanity. And we see it in our day and age. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. From start to finish, the book of Ecclesiastes declares the utter futility and complete meaninglessness of, S S <laughs> of life without God. That's what this book is talking about. It's talking about life has no meaning. Whether you admit it or not, every single one of us in some way, shape, fashion, or form are searching for meaning. We may not even know we're searching for it. Example, you have some kids, a lot of kids, they may act out. Yeah, we could say they act out because of sin, whatever. Yeah, that's natural that it, people are going to act out because of sin. But adolescents act out because they're searching for meaning. They're searching for purpose. And, 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 as, and as the front line, as the father and the mother, hopefully, Lord willing, you know, these children are growing up in, in double dual parent homes. Many times they're not. Many times the dad is bounced. Sorry, and all kind of kids don't take care of them. And then the mom's got to be mom and dad, which is equal is just extremely difficult. But these children are searching for meaning. You go to people that live in, 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 in lower income neighborhoods. That's why gangs are so prevalent, because the gangs give kids meaning because they ain't getting meaning from the home. They ain't getting meaning from the school. They ain't getting meaning from the community. But the gang's like, come on, man, I'll give you meaning. Come here. Come, come, come run this lick. Come do this and you got a family right here. That's why people get caught up. Maybe even people in good families. Maybe they don't get caught up in gangs, but they get caught up in drugs. Why? Because they're searching for meaning. And, and the people that are there are, are not spending time with them. We just talked about that this morning. Spend time with your kids, man. Spend time with your family. You only got so much time to have so much influence in their lives. Man, bless them. Be a blessing. Again, it goes back to, to love is an action word. Love is a verb. Love is doing what you're supposed to do even when you don't want to do it. We all get tired because of the, the nature of sin. And we're like, man, I want to do me or I just want to relax. But the effort we put into other people's lives, we're going to get that back come eternity when we go to heaven. Our reward's going to be great because our Father is going to bless us for everything we've done. Even giving a Dixie cup of water to somebody who was thirsty. That's what the Bible says. Maybe not Dixie cup. But to give a cup of water, a glass of water to somebody you need, you're going to be rewarded for that. But again, purpose, meaning. We all are searching for some form of purpose and meaning. But there's no real purpose and no meaning in life without Jesus Christ. You see, whether it is referring to work or pleasure, wisdom or wealth, power or prestige, entertainment and the such, or life and death, all is considered futile and worthless when God is excluded from the equation. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 14 says, I have seen everything that is done under the sun and behold, all is vanity and a striving after the wind. Think about that. Striving after the wind. <laughs> have you ever tried to run after the wind? <laughs> Go to Frisco. It's real windy up there. Where are you going to go, man? <laughs> You're going to be fumbling, stumbling, looking like a pretzel, falling over yourself. Because we don't know where the wind's coming from or where it's going. But that's what the, the writer is saying. <laughs> Everything that's done under the sun apart from Jesus Christ, apart from God Almighty, apart from Yahweh, is striving after the wind. It's pointless. 
I'm sure we've all been there, whether we admit it or not. It's pointless to live life apart from Christ. There's no, there's no meaning. There's a void you can't fill. It's a vacuum that you can't put. You could try to put every and anything in there. It doesn't, it doesn't suffice. It leaves you empty. It leaves you hungry for more. That's why people run back to drugs. That's why people run back to alcohol. That's why people run back to illicit relationships and pornography and the such. Because it never fills. It loses its luster so quick. And the more you do it, the more you need. Hence, addiction. You don't need a psychologist. You need Jesus Christ. You see, despite his humble confession to God at the declaration of the temple, King Solomon set out to discover the meaning of life using his own reasoning and power without the leading and guidance of God. This is what happened in Solomon's life. Remember, he was the wisest man that ever lived. And I believe he was the wisest man because he pretty much experimented (laughs) and did just about everything a human being could do. And he came to the conclusion that life is meaningless without God. That's why he's the wisest man, because he did it all. And he said, it's 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 meaningless if I don't have a substantial, real foundational relationship with my God, with my creator, with my redeemer. That's how raw and how real it is. And people and the world and the culture can wish it away as much as they want. It doesn't change the fact that that is the truth. That's why we're here in 2023. We got all this technology. We have all these advancements. And people are still struggling with basic fundamental things. They don't even love themselves. Because they haven't found it in God. You see, King Solomon came to understand through his own experiences in life that things are done simply, that things that are done simply as a means in and of themselves, it's vanity. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. If you leave here, church, with nothing else today, leave here with this. Nothing but Jesus Christ alone will ever satisfy Nothing else will ever satisfy but Jesus. It's not cliche-ish. It's not corny. Test the Lord and see that he's good. If you haven't already experienced it, try him and see. I've been there, done that. I lived many years for myself, lost in, 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 in sensuality and lust and the passions of this world. And I'll tell you straight up, it's all worthless. It left me broken, destitute, poor, blind, and naked. Just like the book of Revelation says. In desperate need of a Savior. And praise God, He didn't let me die in my sin. He saved my soul. I'm redeemed. I'm a new creation in Christ. The second main point is this. All things are full of weariness. Eye and ear are never satisfied. Once again, I just put this disclaimer out. In order for us to get to the good news, you got to hear the bad news. You know, I, I, you know, I don't take pleasure. I'm not, I'm not up here berating. I pray that it's not taken in that way. I'm not trying to berate these things. I'm clearly sharing what the scripture says. This is how important this concept is. That the Holy Spirit would deem it fit for Solomon to be used to pen these things so that we would come to understand. It's just not a one-off. He's reiterating these important principles because he knows how wayward we are as people. That's why sometimes we come in here, we hear a message, we say hallelujah, we say amen, some claps, we say praise God. We go back out here and we get in an argument in the car. Or we start yelling and screaming at the top of our lungs 20 minutes after service. Or we're back to the same old shenanigans at 6 p.m. tonight. It's that wayward mentality. You see, we talked about this briefly last week. Why do we grow weary as human beings? It's because of the fall. It's because of sin that entered into man's heart in the Garden of Eden. You see, sin... It erodes us spiritually, physically, psychologically, and emotionally. It erodes. It's a slow erosion. That's why the the Bible says, if if today you hear the Lord's voice, do not harden your heart. 
Because when we harden our hearts, that's that erosion beginning. And left unchecked, it just begins to erode and erode and erode to then our, 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 our consciences become seared and we become so callous and hard that, that God can't get in. And it's not that he can't get in, but you see, God's a gentleman. And he created you and I with free will. He's not going to break down the door of your heart. He's going to be a gentleman. And he's going to knock at the door of your heart. If you're wise, you'll let him in. But if your heart is so hard and callous, you're, you're, you're going to deny him. But he says, he who denies me before men, I will deny him before my, ha- my father in heaven. One in one, everybody dies. None of us are getting out of this life alive unless you happen to get raptured. Don't count on that because you don't know your lifespan and I don't know my lifespan. The reality is we're all going to die and face our maker. So be ahead of the game. (laughs) Know that I'm going to die a physical death. So where do I want to be for eternity and get right with the Lord today? Amen. You see, apart from Christ, all people will one day grow weary with nothing to truly replenish them. That is, that's it, you know? I mean, I'm 44 years old. Um, I'm trying to stay in, in good physical health. But as you see, I got gray hair all over my beard. That's just what it is. I don't believe in dying. I'm not doing that. But gray hair is a part of the eroding process physically. There's, no, there's nothing we can do about it. We could try to dress ourselves up and doll ourselves up, but I always say when, when you see like plastic surgery and the women with plastic surgery, I say, look at the neck and look at the hands. The hands don't lie. They haven't figured out plastic surgery for the hands. For some reason, your hands get bigger as you get older, just like your ears get bigger. And I'm like, I can tell that that woman's older because them, hand, them hands is big and wrinkly. And then the neck, you can't change that. You can change all this. You can try to change all this, but you can't change this and you can't change the hands. That's all part of, part of that erosion process. You know, might as well embrace it and be right with God and have a joyous time and save that money on plastic surgery and go on a trip somewhere. Go spend and do something. Go bless somebody. You know, it's better to, to serve than be served. Amen. <laughs> you see, it is Christ alone who is the bread of life, who is the living water. He is the only one that can ref. Fill us to full capacity, to overflowing and lacking nothing. You see, that's how it is when you get in the game and you start living for the Lord. He starts blessing you. His anointing starts flowing on your life. Man, you start overflowing and it just trickles off. That's why the apostles, I mean, the, the people were like, man, we can walk in the apostles' shadow and get blessed, man, because the Holy Spirit's upon this man so tough. I just be around. That's why the woman was like the woman with the issue of blood. She said, if I just could touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be healed. She had faith to believe that he had that kind of power. Have you experienced that power in your life? Where you're, where you're in a dire circumstance and you just have a joy. I'm not saying it's easy, but you got joy. You're able to rejoice. The Bible says his mercies are new every morning. How many of you yesterday, you thought you weren't going to make it? And you were stressed out. You're struggling. You're like, man, I don't even know what's going on, Lord. What? I thought you loved me, Lord. We watched, uh, we watched what we watched yesterday. Uh, the Lego Jonah is on Pure Flix. It was super cool. It was like a 25-minute thing. And, you know, Jonah, he's like, man, Lord, is this how I'm going to die? <laughs> Little Lego characters in the, in the belly of the whale. He got all this slime over. He's like, this is how I'm going to die, Lord. And a couple minutes later, you see a, more slime on, on, on the sand. He got spit up, you know. But that's how we are sometimes, right? We're like, we're, we're like, this is it. And the Lord's like, no, man. I got a plan and purpose for your life. Just humble yourself, repent, do what I called you to do. Go to Nineveh, man. <laughs> Talk to these people, man. Bless these people. Tell them to repent and get saved. But no, Lord, they're so wicked. Do you see their evil? Or it's like, Jonah, do you see your evil? <laughs> That's why that plant shriveled up, man, because your heart's not right. What plants are shriveling up in our lives, giving us shade because our heart's not right? Bless people, man. Bless the people that don't deserve to be blessed because you didn't deserve to be blessed and neither did I deserve to be blessed. But I got convicted and you got convicted and we responded. So share that same love with those around us. That's what's going to save the world. People want to be like, how's America going to get saved? By blessing people. I don't care about no politician. Ain't no politician going to save America. That's a crock, man. (laughs) 
You better pray, man. Get in your prayer closet. Bless people, man. Be real. Be the one out there that's, that's humbling yourself. Get your hands dirty in the community. Create change like that. Share Christ. Don't back down. That's what's going to save people. I'm passionate about this because I know it's real and I see it in my own life. And, and, I, and I have a grief in my spirit when I see people, especially within the church. I'm not talking about y'all. I'm talking about in general. When we don't get it, it's super simple, man. He said a childlike faith. Trust in Christ with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he will make straight your path. We're looking from here to there, trying to figure out this and that. <laughs> Humble yourself. Be still. Know he is God. He will direct your path every single step of the way, every single day of your life. It's the truth. <laughs> it really is. You see, apart from Jesus Christ, all things are restless. Have you ever asked yourself, why am I restless, man? <laughs> why don't I have peace, man? <laughs> Because you're not centering your life around Jesus. When you're centered around Christ, you have a supernatural peace that supersedes everything you go through. Amen. When you don't have peace, you need to be recalibrated. You need to say, Lord, get me in the right position. <laughs> and sometimes the Lord will, sh will, will show you because he's shown me and I, I'm praying all this. And he's like, Keith, and you do it. You do it. You see, so many times we're looking to God to do everything, but you, you got to understand communion, partnership, relationship is a two-way thing. I'm not saying we're saved by good works. I'm not saying we're saved by our own merit. No, ever, never, never, never. That's not true. But what I'm saying is we have to do our part. You can't be praying, Lord, help me with this, help me with that, and we're not doing what's, what's in our God-given ability to do. Again, he said, seek the kingdom of heaven first above all else and everything else will be added on to you and to I. This morning, are we seeking the kingdom of heaven first? And if we're not, this is a gentle rebuke to you. Stop. Stop doing what you're doing and seek the kingdom of heaven first and watch how it rearranges your life. And watch how you're blessed. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result. You don't have the spirit of insanity. You have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. So for you and I, there's absolutely no excuse. We're the ones who should be strong. We're the ones who should be bringing this to the world because they see how we live. We're supposed to be the salt and the light of the earth. That's what the word of God says. Solomon observed this as well, that, that there, uh, there is an in inherent restlessness in everything. It is so widespread that no one can possibly describe all of the restlessness in life. He has two proofs for this. First, human desire is never satisfied. Ear, uh, the, the, the eye, excuse me, uh, never has enough seen. An example of this is um, take an older person, somebody in there, maybe their 80s or their 90s, who still has somewhat of a sharp mind, right? This person can still desire to see somewhere they've never been. Even though they're, they're older, even though they're up in years, they, they, they can still have a desire. Oh, I would like to go there. I'd like to see this. I'd like to see that. Despite their years, the eye is not tired of seeing. It longs to see other places, other realms, and other customs. The eye is never satisfied. Likewise, likewise the ear is never satisfied with hearing. Think about it. We always get some kind of new alert like every five minutes. As things are happening, your smartphone is like, blah, 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 new alert. And if you're on social media, you're getting social media alert. Blah, 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 this person did that. What in the world? Every other minute where something new is happening in real time and, and we're getting upped on it. We're getting an alert about that. That's why social media is so popular. You see, television, radio shows, and the Internet all cater to the ear's hunger to hear something. That's what it's all about. Oh, I, 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 I got to put a new video up. You just, you just put a, a new video up last I got to put a new video up, though. Because, because you know, my viewers, they're not going to stay with me. I, I got I to gotta pump out like three videos a week. <laughs> Man, bro, are you really about those, you, you really about all those, <laughs> those internet friends, man? You know? Well, that's how I make my living. 
I mean, I get it. I get it. But just don't let it have you. You know what I mean? Think about it. Some juicy gossip about some Hollywood star. It gets thousands of views on YouTube. Oh, man, did you hear this about this person? Did X, Y, and Z. Kim Kardashian. Oh, Khloe Kardashian. Oh, she got blonde hair now. And, I know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, she got five kids now. She got an estranged kid from another relationship when she was 21. People click on oh, 21,000 views. Do I really care about Khloe Kardashian like that? And I'm not speaking bad on her. I'm just saying. You know, some of these people, they can't help it. They're just in the public eye and people are making all kind of videos about them. And, you know, what, what is the clickbait and people are just clicking on it because they get their views. Again, the ear never tires because human desire is never satisfied. It is a consequence of the restlessness that is built into human life. But this is a sobering reality. Even though we long to see or hear something new, nothing new ever really shows up life is a cycle of what has happened before it is the old played over and over again this too is a result of the restlessness that is built into life although something looks new to us actually there is nothing new under the sun it's funny because i I was i was preparing for this message i don't know it might have been tuesday or something and i'm sitting down in the living room and i'm I'm typing stuff i'm looking stuff up on the internet i'm going through the word of god and and tears is watching this cartoon and 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 this cartoon singing uh, i don't know the tune i'm not going to sing it i'll spare you that but it's basically saying monday through friday then it's the weekend again and it's saying it over and over and over and i'm like wow lord (laughs) even in this little kids cartoon it's like it's just monotonous man it's just a cycle of life. Monday through Friday, and then it's the weekend again. Isn't that how we feel sometimes? <laughs> Working, busting your butt, you know, earning your, earning your keep by the sweat of your brow. It's like, man, Monday through Friday, and it's the weekend. A lot of people just living for the weekend. Hate their job, just living for the weekend so they can have 48 hours of, of some kind of, you know, away from, away, away from that place, <laughs> away from those people. Man, I don't even know if I'm going to get through these main points. Third main point. <laughs> There's nothing new under the sun. Okay, this phrase, under the sun, it's used 29 times in this book of Ecclesiastes and nowhere else in Scripture. The intended meaning in Ecclesiastes is that what happens under the sun in a life separated from God is universal. The point of view in Ecclesiastes is that it's an earthbound perspective. Apart from God, there's nothing new under the sun. Again, to say that there's nothing new under the sun means that there is nothing really new here on earth. All the activity of man during his lifetime is lost in the greater scheme of things and will soon be forgotten. To say that there is nothing new under the sun does not ignore inventions or advances in technology. Rather, these inventions do not amount to any basic change in the world. That's what it means. It's not saying that you know, they didn't have the internet 2,000 years ago? Obviously, they didn't. But is the internet making that big of a significant change? Really not. And I'm all for technology. I'm all for the blessings that we can have in modern medicine and all these things. People are still dying for can- from cancer. You're going to die. You're going to go back to the dirt where you came from. Technology cannot give you salvation, cannot save your soul. Now, you can use technology to spread the gospel. That's fine. But in and of itself, technology and medicine is not going to save a person's soul. In Solomon's time, many advances took place in society. But from the larger perspective of life, human nature has remained and always will remain the same. The, true, the same is true in our day and age. Again, I just talked about it. We have great advances in medicine and technology, yet human beings still kill each other. <laughs> we still kill each other. We're still, we're still racist. Even though we talked about a couple weeks back, there, there's, 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 there's Jewish people that are, that are a lot lighter than Mark and darker than me. So what, 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 what are we talking about here? You know, race is a, is, is, is a sham that they, they, they gave us years ago and people took the bait. <laughs> you know, we all bleed red blood. You know, my brain is where my brain is, where is everyone else's brain is. My heart is where my heart's at. My kidneys are where my, you know what I mean? Come on now, it, it, you know. How, how, how weak would life be if we all had the same skin tone and we all looked exactly the same? We'd be a bunch of stinking drones, man. A bunch of robots. 
And in our culture now, oh, celebrate the diversity. Yeah, I get that, but there's an ulterior motive behind that. But celebrate the diversity that God created in humanity is what it should rather be. You see, ultimately life involves more than what happens under the sun. Living for God and his glory is the goal of life. Those who do not seek this goal will be judged. Even our good deeds that have gone unnoticed in this life are seen by God and will be rewarded in the future. I talked about that briefly a couple minutes ago. This knowledge should result in a life lived for God with a deep, with a deep love for others and a desire to make a difference. Amen? All right. Now we can kind of unpack these verses a little bit closer. So again, verse 1, it says, The words of the preacher, the son of David, king of Jerusalem. The book of Ecclesiastes is one of the most unusual and perhaps most difficult books to understand in the Bible because there's a spirit of hopelessness and despair in this book. It has no praise or peace, and it seems to promote questionable conduct. Ultimately, the words of the preacher show us the futility and foolishness of life lived without an eternal perspective. The question in this book isn't about the existence of God, because quite frankly, King Solomon was not an atheist. God is always there. The question is whether or not God matters. Clearly, you and I know today or should know today that God does matter. The answer to this question is vitally connected to a responsibility to God that goes beyond this earthly life. In search for this answer, the preacher searches the depths of humanity and the human experience, including despair. He thoroughly examined the emptiness of and futility of life live without eternity before coming to the conclusion of the, necess the necessity of eternity. The application is this. Today we face this same reality, that nothing has meaning and nothing matters under the sun. But we must come to realize through the revelation of God alone that everything matters. Scripture is clear. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 14 tells us, For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. So everything does matter. Everything you do. Maybe you don't get attaboys from people. Maybe people don't notice the good things you do. Your heavenly Father does. Remember, you and I should be doing what we're doing before an audience of one. The minute you and I start doing things to please people, we're done. The minute I get up here and preach for your applause, for your approval, I'm done. I don't do this. I'm not putting on a show. This is, this is not entertainment. The love I have for Christ that he's given me for him is the love I'm sharing with you. And that's why I do what I do. That's why I tell you, I don't, I don't ask my wife, how does the sermon go? I don't do that. There's no reason. You know, this is serious business when, when we're sharing the word of God, but it, it's, it's before an audience of one. I want my heavenly father to be pleased with what I'm doing. Again, the phrase, the preacher, the idea of this is someone who might gather, lead, or speak to a group of people in a congregation. That's why he's mentioned as the preacher, okay? These are definitely the words of the preacher, but in this sermon, he, his focus is on God uh, it, it, it's, it's indirect, excuse me, it's indirect. He's, he's not necessarily focusing on God. He's sharing, again, what the Lord has shown him. Um, because when you look at this book, it makes no mention of Yahweh, the Lord, the name uh, of the God of Israel's covenant faith. It scarcely refers to the law of God. It seems to be that the preacher's argument stands on its own feet and does not depend on Israel's covenant faith to be valid. He's basically appealing to a universal crowd that they would be observant of all these facts. All people from every nation, tribe, and tongue will experience all these things. If we do not live a life rested in Christ Jesus, life will be meaningless. And then we see this phrase, the son of David. This identifies the preacher as David's son, Solomon. Some tend to believe that someone else uh, other than Solomon wrote this book, but there's no compelling reason to say anyone else other than Solomon actually wrote it. In chapter 1, verse 16, the preacher talks about wisdom surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before him. And we all know that Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. This rules out any other successor to the matchless King Solomon. And then we see this, this statement, uh, King in Jerusalem. 
from his royal standing. In a sense, only Solomon had the wisdom, the freedom, and the resources to actually write this book. Again, he experienced any and all things. He, 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 didn't, he didn't deny himself any pleasure. So this is why he, he, could, he could amass all of this wisdom because he found out, man, I did, any, I did every single thing I wanted and it all led to nothing. <laughs> have you been there? Maybe you're not, maybe you don't have money like, uh, wealth like Solomon, but have you done everything and come to the point where you're like, it's left me empty. It don't work. I know I have in, in my little short time of life, not that I'm as wise as Solomon, surely I'm not, and surely I don't have the wealth of Solomon, but I've, in my own sphere of influence, I've done everything I could possibly do. I've indulged myself in all kinds of things, and, and it leaves you empty. It doesn't fulfill. You're just disgusted with yourself, and you just leave wreckage behind you of all kinds of people's lives that you've messed up. It's not a good thing. A side note, the particular brand of wisdom that characterizes Ecclesiastes is well attested in the ancient world. It was what was known as uh, pessimist literature. Ecclesiastes is the only biblical example of this old kind of uh, literary tradition. That's pretty cool uh, if you like to nerd out on stuff like that. Okay, verse 2, vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Okay. Don't want to bust your bubble if you like... Vanity Fair, but this is what it is. Vanity of vanities. The preacher begins his sermon with the first conclusion. This is not his ultimate conclusion, but this is something to point out. Looking at life all around, he judges it to be vanity. Nothing useless, meaningless. Vanity includes brevity and unsustainability, emptiness, unreliability, frailty, and futility. Job chapter 9, verse 29 speaks on this futility. Job went on to say, I shall, I shall be condemned. <laughs> why then do I labor in vain? Like, why do I do this if I'm just going to be condemned? It's useless, it's pointless, it's meaningless. Again, this phrase, vanity of vanities. To strengthen his point, the preacher judged life to be the ultimate vanity, the vanity of vanities. And all in all, it was just vain. This Hebrew phrasing is used to express intensity or the ultimate of something. Just like, you know, when we refer to the Lord, the Holy of Holies. Right. He dwells in the Holy of Holies, the utmost place where, where, you know, it's the purest ever. That's where, you know, the throne of God dwells. This phrase or something quite like it will be used about 30 times in this short book. This is one of the major themes in the book of Ecclesiastes. And then we see after that, it says not 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 just vanity of vanities, but all is vanity. To further strengthen his point, Solomon noted not only that life is vanity, but that all is vanity. It seems that every part of life suffers from this emptiness. We see from the first two verses that Solomon wrote this from a certain perspective, a perspective that through the book he will expose as inadequate and wrong. Most of all, Ecclesiastes is written from this perspective through the eyes of a man who thinks and lives as if God does not matter. The application is this. It is an absolutely accurate statement of life when it is lived under the certain conditions. Not living to honor God, but it is not true as a statement of what life must necessarily be. An example of this is simply, if you were to say, my life isn't full of vanity. It isn't meaningless. I I have meaning. My, my, My life is filled with meaning and purpose. That's great, but you still can't ignore the premise of the preacher. The reality is a life lived without God is meaningless under the sun. You see, we talked about this a minute ago as well. Unless you find your purpose in Christ, you haven't found meaning because everyone is searching for meaning and purpose in their lives. Think about this. This is why people take up meaningful causes to their heart, right? This is why people say, well, I'm going to volunteer at the homeless shelter or I'm going to volunteer at the veterinarian, the veterinarian clinic And I'm going to help these animals or or I'm going to volunteer at the Boys and Girls Club because they're trying to to do something meaningful in their life, something that's going to bless people. Think about it. We know many well-known philanthropists, right? And and they give millions of dollars to, to causes that they believe are honorable and are right. And all of that is great. 
But without the perspective of doing those things to honor the Lord, without having a genuine holy fear of Him, it's meaningless. It's meaningless. All right, let's look at verse 3. What does man gain by all his toil at which he toils under the sun? What profits a man from all his labor? Using the language from the world of business, the preacher asks a worthy question. He knew that life is, is filled with labor, but what is it worth? What does it profit? The definition of profit is this, a financial gain, obtaining a financial advantage or benefit, especially from an investment. Profit, the word profit is a commercial term. Life's pay, life doesn't pay any dividends. Jesus expresses a similar thought in Mark chapter 8, verse 36. He says, For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in exchange or return for his soul? The application is this. You and I, church, you and I, saints, cannot be deceived into believing that the pursuit of stuff will ever satisfy us. Like I say it all the time from the pulpit. There's nothing wrong with having things. Don't let those things have you. You see, we actually don't gain anything from being served. Like when, when you know, people are serving you, you don't gain anything. It's actually a test <laughs> of how you're praised. It's a test. How, how are you going to respond? But you don't gain anything when you're being served. But... We are to follow after the characteristics of Jesus. You see, he came not to be served, but to serve. In humility and service is the only way one will be exalted by God. And that is how we find our purpose in him alone. If you're wondering, man, Lord, like, why does it feel like my, my walk's dry? Why does it feel like I'm not, I'm not moving forward in what you have for me? May it be that you're not humbling yourself. May it be that you're, you're, you're looking to exalt yourself instead of humble yourself. Is it, could it be that you're looking to be served instead of serving? See, when people want to enter the ministry, they don't realize, like, it's all about service. It ain't about you. The pastor should be the first one going to the toilet if it needs to be plunged. Go in here, go in there, doing whatever. Because it's about service, man. It's not about having a placard parking in front of the building. It's not about having a, you know, your picture up there on the wall. It's not about that. It's about serving people, humbling people. Do you realize that back in the day, they had nasty, they didn't have Jordans. They had some sandals. And can you imagine walking on those dirt roads that were unpaved and the stuff they were stepping on, man? <laughs> all them animals and, and dung that was all over the place, all up in their nails, all up in between their feet. What did Jesus do? He got a basin of water. He got down on his knees. And what did he do? He cleaned the disciples' feet. Nasty, dirty, stinky feet. That's humility. And he's asking us to do the same in the spirit. Humble ourselves and serve people. If it doesn't cost me anything, I'm not really serving. If it's not costing you anything, you're not serving. I'm sorry. That's the truth. That's biblical. But this is how you and I become exalted. This is how you and I get the peace of God that passes all understanding by taking the posture of a servant. Matthew chapter 20 verse 28 says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew chapter 23 verse 12 says, Whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted. And the last phrase of this, this verse, it says, in which he toils under the sun. This is the first stating of an essential theme through, the, through this book. This phrase will be repeated more than 25 times. The idea isn't on a sunny day or something to have to do with the weather. The idea is that in this world that we can see the material world. It is life considered without an eternal perspective. The person who's just living for the now. The person who's just living their best life now. They don't care about anything else. They're just trying to get theirs. <laughs> They're living it up right now in the moment. If our view of life goes no further than under the sun, all of our endeavors 
will have an undertone of misery. Who wants to be miserable? Misery sucks. If you don't want to be miserable, honor God. Don't live as if God doesn't exist. The use of the phrase under the sun shows that the writer's interest was universal and not limited to his own people and land. This applies to Jew and Gentile alike. Doesn't matter who you are. This is going to touch every person if they're willing to open up their heart and allow the word of God to come in. Amen. All right. Four through seven. We're, we're just about to wrap it up in another few minutes. A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind. And on its circuits, the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there there they flow again. All right. Using several examples, Solomon observes that nothing seems to change very much in this unending cycle of nature. He looks out on humanity and sees that one aspect of the world is full of births, and in another aspect, life is full of deaths. People are just, they're born and they die. Coffins and cradles are the main furniture of life. This is a statistic The United Nations estimate that on average about 385,000 babies are born each day around the world. And the global number of deaths per day are around 150,000. That's what's going on. So right now somebody's being born and somebody's dying. That's going on right now (laughs) as you and I are taking our breaths. Once again, if our view of these births and deaths are void of a holy fear of God, we simply just grow numb to life and slip into a sense of believing that life has no purpose. And that's why people are like, I I can go ahead and abort this baby because I got to do me. I'm numb to the fact that I got a baby in my belly and I'm going to do me because my career or my life is more important than I can have babies another time. Don't do that. You don't know if you're going to be able to give birth 10 years down the line. If the Lord has put something in your womb, allow that thing to live. I'm sure you've heard someone say, what's the point? We're all going to die anyways. I might as well go get mine. Let me do it. It's all good. I'm going to die. So what, man? I'm going to live right now, bro. This is how we, you know what I'm saying? Me and the own voice is how we get down, bro. Come on, man. You weak, dog. That's <laughs> how cats be, man. They think they're being, I mean, I'm a man, bro. You better take that shot, bro. <laughs> Tripping, bro. I'm not doing that, man. <laughs> the sun also rises. The wind goes towards the south. The rivers run into the sea. From what Solomon could observe under the, uh, the sun, these unchanging cycles express the unchanging monotony of life, leading to its vanity and meaningless. The application is this, church. All the rivers of earthly joy, right? They may be flowing into your heart. Notice I said earthly, not godly. All the earthly joy may be flowing into your heart, but it will never fill it. It will never fill the reservoir that that needs to be filled by Christ. They're going to recede. It's going to go dry. It's going to ebb and flow. But it will never satisfy because Christ is is the only true contentment. We need not go outside of him for new delights. And to know him is to possess a secret which makes all things new. I'm getting to the best part of the message right here. Just stay with me. I know it's been kind of treachery because we got to talk about the bad stuff. But, but that key phrase, he in him, in Christ, is the secret that makes all things new. This is the last portion of our our message this morning, 8 through 11. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor is the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. And And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it is said, see, this is new? It has been done already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of the later things yet to be among those who come after. Okay. 
it's crazy because without me being filled with the Holy Spirit, I'm going to be weary up here. <laughs> I am not going to have the energy to be able to exhibit and share the word of God. I, nobody can. No preacher can share without being filled with the Holy Spirit. There's just no way. Or it's going to be completely ineffective and go over everyone's head. Anyways, to that, this statement, all things are full of weariness. Man cannot express it. You see, Solomon then observed that the meaninglessness of life wasn't only reflected in nature. This frustration is also evident in human effort and endeavor. Despite all of man's working, we labor hard, seeing and hearing. We're never satisfied. It's impossible to know how much anxiety, pain, labor, and fatigue are necessary in order to carry out the common mundane tasks of life. Just getting up every morning at five in the morning and doing what you got to do and stay in the course the whole day. Without Christ, man, that, 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 that's, that, that's painstaking. Man, that's hard. That's brutal. That's why people, man, they come into their workplace and they just have a bitter look on their face. Because it's like, I've been doing this for 25 years and it's like, I don't want to do this no more. I'm tired of this. But I got to work. I got to earn my keep so I can pay for bills, so I can die. <laughs> so I can give it to someone and I don't even know. We'll get into that later in the book. I don't even know if this person's even going to take care of what I leave them. But an endless desire to gain and an endless curiosity to witness a variety of results causes men to labor on. Because they're like, I got to keep going. I got to keep doing it. This is a question. Apart from Jesus Christ giving your life purpose and meaning, what is the difference between a hamster in a wheel that's a prison that runs faster and faster to make time go by and the person who lives to labor for material objects that they may never obtain? What's the difference between the two? Striving. Striving for this, striving for that. You may never obtain it. Working so hard for what? What's the difference between you and that hamster? <laughs> There's no real difference. Because apart from Christ, there is no meaning. Apart from Christ, the, 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 the pursuit is in vain. It's Christ that gives purpose and meaning to everything you and I do. Without Christ, whether we eat, sleep, or drink, whatever you do, do to the glory of God. Without Christ, you can't do that. You can't eat to the glory of God. You can't breathe your breath to the glory of God. You can't bless and love other people in your life to the glory of God without Jesus at the center. It's him who gives meaning and purpose to your life and mine. That which is what will be and that which is done, it will be done. There's nothing new under the sun. You see, despite all man's work and progress, life seems monotonous and the same. This seems to get very old quickly. <laughs> and again, it can still be said there's nothing new under the sun. This is very interesting. When I understood this, this blew my mind. Do you want to know why there's nothing new under the sun? It's because you and I were created with eternity in mind. Do not lose sight of that, church. You're an eternal being. You're created for beyond this. That's why everything you and I do, it doesn't satisfy because this is not what, this is not the end all. This is not the goal. This is the training ground to get to the goal, to the new Jerusalem, to be with the Lord God forever and eternity. That's why this stuff doesn't satisfy. You guys, some of you guys know I like making beats in my, in my spare time. I like, I like producing. I like, you know I mean? I'll, I'll listen to sermons. I'll take, you know, snippets from sermons and put it in the music. I don't rap no more, but I'm all about making beats. And the Lord showed me this the other day. I'm always trying to get to the next beat. And, I, and I've gotten a lot better with the beat making. I'm like, you yeah, know, these are cool. I like it. But the thing is, it doesn't satisfy. Why doesn't it satisfy? Because this is not, this is not it. <laughs> This is not it. Though, though that music can never satisfy me because I'm an eternal being. I, I'm created for eternal fellowship with God Almighty. And the temporal things, the temporal accomplishments cannot compare to the eternal fellowship with God who created me in his own image and you in his own image. There is nothing new under the sun, but... Thankfully, for followers of Jesus, those born again by God's spirit don't live under the sun in that sense. 
their life is filled with new things. And this is what I was talking about when I was speaking to, this is the best part of the message. So please don't tune out. I'm going to go through these verses, but I pray that this will fill you with a sense of encouragement and a renewal of your heart and your mind that there are so many new things for me and you as children of God. First, a new name. Revelation chapter 2, verse 17 says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give him some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name written on the stone that no one knows except to the one who receives it. You get to look forward to that. You have a new name in Christ, and you're going to receive that one day. A new community. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14 says, For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. That's in Christ Jesus. We have a new community in him, the body of Christ. A new help from angels. Psalm chapter 91 verse 11 says, For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Do you know that? Did you wake up this morning knowing that the Lord has sent angels to guard you in everything you do? A new commandment. John chapter 13 verse 34. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. You're living in that new commandment. The rest of the world, they just love themselves. They don't love anybody else, but you love yourself and you love others. Man, to the glory of God, that's such a beautiful thing. A new covenant. Jeremiah chapter uh, 31 verse 33 says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Remember, when Moses went to Sinai, what happened, man? The, the, The law was on the stone tablets, man, and they broke. But now we have the word of God imprinted on our flesh, fleet hearts. That's the new covenant that you and I have, Jew and Gentile alike. Next, a new living, a new and living way to heaven. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 20. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up, For us through the curtain that is through his flesh. You have full access to God the Father through Jesus Christ. You don't need some man interceding for you. You don't need to be telling some priest or whatever. You just go straight to God. Because Christ has made that way for you and I. A new purity. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 7. Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. You and I have been given a new nature. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24 says, And to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. You are a new creation in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All things have become new. Revelation chapter 21, verse 5. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. You see, church, the evidence is overwhelming. Apart from Jesus Christ, there is nothing new. Life is mundane and monotonous. But a life hidden in Jesus Christ, there will always be a freshness and a newness that this present world can never offer or satisfy. Amen? Amen. John chapter 10 verse 10 says, The thief came only to steal and kill and destroy. I, speaking of Jesus, the Messiah, came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Find your abundant life in Christ. Father God, we thank you for just the revelation of your truth. Thank you that you manifest yourself to us through the power of the Holy Spirit, through your written word. Lord, 
we ask that you would help us to recognize that we are new creations in Christ, that the former things are gone and passed away, and that we can pursue a relationship with you all the days of our life. We can experience your grandeur and, 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 and the greatness that you have for us here on earth. We don't have to wait till we die. Father, I pray that you would change our mindset to be Christ-centered, to be uh, you know, putting you first and then people after and then we follow. Father, help us to be servants. Help us to, to not get caught up in, in the issues of life, but to cast all our cares upon you and to look to you alone to satisfy us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.